This video is supported by the project called Gregor Mendel's Legacy to Science, Culture and Humanity, co-financed by the Interreg Austria Czech Republic. More about the project at the end of the video. Hello everyone, welcome back to the Genomics Bootcamp. This time it is another presentation on the history of science related to Gregor Mendel. It is a presentation from Dr. Barbara Fischer titled Mendel, Doppler and Unger, Viennese influences on Mendel's work. This presentation was originally held at the Mendel Days conference in Brno in 2021. I had the pleasure to be there and I was really impressed about the talk. So right there and then I asked Dr. Fisher if we could re-record it for the purposes of Genomics Bootcamp. And I am happy that she agreed so we can bring you this presentation on Mendel's time in Vienna. Actually, it is a really interesting one because it gives a context how Mendel spent his time during his studies in Vienna. Well, Mendel famously failed once, uh, well, when he was doing his studies, but later on he returned and actually took a bunch of courses in a very specialized curriculum, which then later allowed him to lay the groundwork for his famous discoveries. Before we start the presentation, just a few more words about our presenter. So Dr. Barbara Fischer is an evolutionary biologist from the University of Vienna. This is actually the very same university Mendel studied at. Dr. Fischer works at the Department of Theoretical Biology at University of Vienna, and I will include a link to her webpage where you can find more about her presentations and work, which is actually centered on the evolution of childbirth. So I just encourage you to check out this site and look up her other publications as well to learn more about the things she's doing. But for now, we move forward to the presentation of today, and that is Mendel, Doppler and Unger, Viennese influences on Mendel's work. Hi, my name is Barbara Fischer. I'm an evolutionary biologist at the University of Vienna. And today I will talk about uh, Gregor Mendel and especially his uh, time in Vienna when he was a student at the University of Vienna. Everybody knows uh, Mendel and his famous experiments on peace and how he arrived at uh, the famous Mendelian laws after years of experimentation. But my talk today is about... Uh, the time when he was a student and um, how he actually acquired the skills that uh, were so essential for conducting those important experiments. So um, Mendel actually was already working as an assistant teacher for a while and he tried to get certified as a teacher for a gymnasium and to do that he had to take an exam at Vienna University and he, he took that exam in 1850 and he didn't pass, he actually failed with and got some quite harsher comments from his examiners. And after that, it was decided also by the abbot uh, Nap um, at the monastery where he, he was um, working as a monk, uh, that he should enroll as a university student to improve his knowledge, basically, to get uh, scientific training um, before retaking this exam. And so Mendel went to Vienna and stayed there for a while to enroll as a university student. And before I actually talk a, a little bit more about his studies and, and the teachers he was um, exposed to at the University of Vienna, I want to talk a little bit about what Vienna was actually like as a city in the 19th century, because it was, of course, very different than, than it is now. So here I'm showing you an image um, depicting a flooding of the Viennese suburbs. Here on the right, um, you see the suburbs of Leopoldstadt, this is the so-called uh, canal, and here on the left we have the inner city, and back in those days, in 1850, the city center still was uh, surrounded by city walls, and um, these floodings, which are, one of them is actually depicted here and happened just before the year when Mendel uh, came to Vienna, these were quite um, important events because they were usually followed by epidemic outbreaks. The reason for this was that the um, people acquire, uh, got their drinking water from local wells and uh, the well wells became polluted after those floodings. So that led to outbreaks of typhoid and, and cholera. Those were not the only diseases. The population was plagued 
are by. There was also tuberculosis, of course, which was a major cause of uh, death in the 19th century. Actually, it was the most common infectious disease back then and caused uh, the death of a quarter of the Viennese population in the 19th century. So the epidemics were a little bit different than what we are exposed to now with COVID, but there are obviously some parallels. Those were a part of everyday life, basically, for, for the people in, of Vienna back then. Also cholera-related to several severe epidemics and typhoid. And those drinking water-based epidemics only ended when a uh, resilient canal system was put in place towards the end of the 19th century. And also once the drinking water was um, moved away from wells, but uh, water pipes, the pipeline system was actually built. That was a major building project actually in the second half of the 19th century in Vienna. And that ended up saving many, many lives. So here are some more pictures of the city from the end of the 19th century. So this is a little bit, a little uh, these are a little bit younger than when, when Mendel came to Vienna. Mendel arrived in Vienna in 1851. And these are from the end of the 19th century because, um, well, this was when photography was already available and, and became more widespread. Unfortunately, there are no photos that show the city life from the middle of the 19th century that I could show you today. So I want to show you those instead so that you get an impression of what the city actually looked like. Here we see a scene that is similar to the one depicted on the previous image, but now the city walls um, around the first district are gone. And in place of those city walls, here we see the, the K, the Franz Josef K, the, the Ringstrasse has been built already here and these um, means of public transport here on the road are so-called uh, horse trams so these are trams on rails that are pulled by horses the first means of public transport in the city here is the Naschmarkt a market scene and again horse carriages and horse trams on the road and this is the Stefan Storm St. Stephen's uh, Cathedral in, in the back here in the inner city this is the, the Wiener Prater. Here you see the famous giant Ferris wheel. Um, and uh, this is a scene from Amhof in the inner city center, uh, again with a market here. Um, these houses, these house fronts, they look pretty much the same now. If you walk around the inner city in Vienna, uh, not so much has actually changed from back then. Of course, the market looks different now. The people look different, but the house fronts, they are pretty much the same. Yeah, and here is an, an image depicting the, the art back then. This is um, composer and pianist Franz Schubert um, by the piano. Um, this is just to highlight that uh, despite the fact that um, life was uh, hard in Vienna in these days, Vienna was, of course, also a city of um, art and music. And many of the famous uh, composers that are so well known um, to represent the, the culture of Vienna, um, did their work in the 19th century, such as uh, Schubert and also Beethoven, for example. But, well, apart from the aristocracy and the upper middle class uh, who lived in prosperity and enjoyed, had an enjoyable life and could actually enjoy the music as depicted here on this image, many people the, the, of the general population were actually um, struggling for survival. Child mortality was very high. I already said that those epidemics waves obviously cost uh, many, many lives, but also uh, neonatal and, and child mortality were incredibly high. Uh, one of the reasons um, for this was, of course, that there were no, there was no proper birth control. So there were, were a lot of um, unwed mothers and uh, this uh, was attached to a large uh, social stigma. Um, and there was an institution back then in Vienna called the Wiener Findlingsheim or Foundlings Home that took in babies born to um, unwed mothers. And back in um, 1850, when Mendel came to Vienna, um, they took in about 20 to 30 children a day. So these are incredibly huge numbers. And these were, were about the, a third of all births that happened in Vienna back then. So a third of all babies born were handed over to the Findlingsheim and there they were taken care of uh, more or less. But um, many, many of them didn't survive. About 80% of these children actually died and um, the 
majority in the first year of life. This was also connected to bad nutrition. And then, of course, the no clean drinking water that was given to the babies and they got infectious diseases just like the rest of the population and were just not healthy enough to fight those. So neonatal mortality was um, shockingly high. So the Vienna of the 19th century was a city of, of a huge contrast. On the one hand, there was this um, very hard everyday life for the majority of the population. On the other hand, there was the aristocracy and the upper middle class, class who lived in prosperity. Um, and then Mendel came to Vienna. And um, this is a, um, his uh, registration sheet, his inscriptionsblatt of his uh, third semester in listing the courses that he took when he was a university student. So um, when he came to Vienna in the first semester, he studied a lot of physics. And then later on, he also took classes in uh, biology. And up here is he's giving some biographical information. And down here is actually listing these courses. And he's giving the, the weekly hours, the semester, Wochenstunden, as they're called in German. And here are the names of his professors. And some of those um, you may probably know. Um, so here are my translations of of these courses. He took um, um, a course in experimental physics, demonstration in, in experimental physics with Dr. Doppler. This is the famous uh, Christian Doppler. Um, he took a course in zoology with uh, Knea. And here it's interesting to add that Knea was one of his um, examiners in this uh, failed attempt to become certified as a teacher. So Knea actually harshly failed him. He had some rather um, unpleasant comments for for um, Mendel. He wasn't um, he wasn't pleased with his uh, delivery with his performance at all. And then Mendel went back and um, studied zoology with his uh, harsh teacher. So that's also an interesting side fact. Then uh, Mendel studied chemistry with uh, Rettenbacher, and he took a course in. Uh, mathematics with a uh, mood in the application of logarithmic and trigonometric tables, so very applied. And then he studied botany with uh, Unger. He took a course in the anatomy and physiology of plants and also a practical course in uh, how to use the microscope. So um, very hands-on education, uh, which he, he got here. Uh, now I would actually like to um, talk you through some of the locations of where all of this took place when Mendel was a student in Vienna. This is a, a city map of Vienna from 1825, so a little bit before Mendel got there, but um, the city looked pretty much the same when Mendel actually arrived in Vienna. The city forti fortifications were also still in place back then. Um, here you see them depicted on this map. Around the city fortifications, there was this green band called the Glacis, which was then later became the location where the uh, Ringstrasse was built. And those colorful dots, which I've indicated on this map here, let's zoom in a little bit, uh, those denote locations that uh, were important for Mendel uh, during his time in Vienna. Um, the first one is this, this pink one here. Um, which was the um, Elisabethinen Kloster, the convent um, of the sisters uh, of uh, Elizabeth in the third uh, district um, of Vienna called Landstrasse. Back then it, uh, it was a convent and it also housed a, a hospital for women. Now it still actually houses a hospital. And um, Mendel found accommodation there. So he hadn't actually acquired this housing, this accommodation. When he got to Vienna, he just went there, apparently knocked at the door and was taken in and found a place to live. And that was quite conveniently located because um, you see that some of the other locations where he actually studied were rather close by. So the next one where he took a lot of courses was here, was this new Institute of uh, Experimental Physics of the University of Vienna. And uh, I don't have a picture of this institute to show you because this was um, a house that doesn't exist anymore. Something else was built in this location. Um, but then Mendel also studied geology and he did that uh, here in the Royal Imperial Geological Institute, which is located just around the corner of where he lived um, in the Pali Rasumovsky, that's this yellow dot here. So this is all just a few minutes walking distance from where he actually lived. Then we have another um, location of a um, yeah, scientific institute back then down here. That one is very prominent and still exists today. Here, here's the Renweg. That's, of course, the, what is now the Botanical Institute of the University of Vienna, back then called the Botanical Museum. 
um, attached to the botanical gardens. And this is what it looked like. And um, um, here we have another image from the back um, depicting the greenhouses and the gardens of the botanical museum. So now we are almost through. Down here is the Teresianum. This is where Mendel studied uh, chemistry and also mathematics. Now the Teresianum is a, a school, a gymnasium, a public school. Then there's one more missing here in the um, city center. This is the building that was the old university of Vienna in the middle of the 19th century. Only later, the, what is now the main building of the University of Vienna along the Ringstrasse was built. And this um, old university building and the area um, around it, they were quite important in what happened in Vienna a few years before, two years before Mendel got there, namely in 1848. There was a, a re revolution took place in, in Vienna and uh, uh, the students and citizens took to the streets and they uh, demanded um, democratic rights, they demanded an, a constitution and an abolition of censorship and they wanted political participation. So here you see the students on the streets in front of the old university building. This is the wing of the old university uh, called the Neue Aula. Uh, now in Vienna, this building houses the Academy of uh, Science is not the university anymore. Also the workers took part in these uprisals. They also took to the streets. They demanded um, um, higher wages. They protested against food so shortages. Um, but the Habsburg leadership, they made some quick concessions, but then on the long term, they basically beat down these revolutions. Uh, there were very, very few consequences. There was no, um, the democratic rights didn't really happen. But what actually did happen was uh, that an educational reform took place. So the student demands were, in terms of the education, in terms of their education, were successful. There was a new... Um, educational minister named who was a liberal reformer and his name was Thun Hohenstein and uh, he was quite successful with his uh, liberal reforms only one year after this revolution so in um, 1848 by the end of 1848 uh, censorship of uh, professor's writings was discontinued and uh, restrictions on lectures and textbooks were lifted and also scientific seminars and in institutes were introduced uh, who involved the students in conducting research, who made the students part of the research community rather than keeping them um, quiet, just listening to lectures. Also, the habilitation was introduced as a teaching qualification at the university back then. So the educational reform was really far-reaching. And one very important thing that very much mattered for for Mendel and what came later was that uh, this uh, new minister of education, Thun Hohenstein, also hired a number of um, a number of new professors, promising new professors, especially for the natural sciences. And um, he wanted to bring people who did empirical research in the natural sciences to the University of Vienna. And um, he hired Christian Doppler and he also hired Franz Unger, who I will talk a little bit more about um, a little later. And it was actually the Emperor Franz Josef who had to sign off on the on the hiring forms of uh, each of these uh, professors who who took on their new positions at the university and who only shortly afterwards became very instrumental teachers um, of Gregor Mendel. So here are some of these professors of, of Mendel in Vienna, and you've seen their names already on the previous slide where I've listed his courses. So this, this is an image depicting the members of the Division of Mathematics and the Natural Sciences of the uh, Imperial Academy of Sciences in Vienna. And uh, some of the names you recognize from before. Um, here we see um, Karl Ludwig von Littrow, who was an astronomer. This is uh, Josef Rettenbacher, the chemist who Mendel studied with. This is Eduard, Eduard Wenzel, who was a botanist. He was also the director of the Botanical Museum. This is uh, Franz Unger. Um, Mendel's influential teacher in evolution and in botany, who was professor at the University of Vienna. 
And here we have uh, Andreas von Ettingshausen, who was a physicist. He actually became director of the new Institute of Experimental Physics right after Doppler. Christian Doppler had this position only for about two years, and then his health deteriorated very quickly. And then he had to step down, and um, Andreas Ettingshausen took over. But both had this um, very hands-on approach towards teaching physics. Andreas Ettingshausen was a mathematical physicist. He also wrote a, a textbook on combinatorics, uh, which Mendel probably read and was influenced by. Um, and here we see Anton Schröter von Christelli, who was also a physicist. So you see that on this picture, Christian Doppler is missing. This is because um, this uh, is stems from 1853, depicts the members um, of the Division of Mathematics and Natural Sciences from 1853. And Christian Doppler um, already died in 1853 in, in Venice of his lung disease. So he was not uh, there anymore at, at the time, but of course he was earlier. And now I want to talk a little bit more about, uh, about Doppler. I already said that um, Doppler became the first director of this new Institute of Experimental Physics that was founded after the university reform, after this educational reform um, initiated by Thun Hohenstein uh, took place in Austria. And uh, uh, Christian Doppler implemented a uh, very, very uh, hands-on practical physics education. He taught this course in demonstration of experimental physics, where he showed experiments to the students, the students who were supposed to become uh, teachers, um, gymnasium teachers for physics uh, later. And it was very important for him to have these experiments um, um, have um, empirical investigation as part of the education. So the students were shown these experiments, but they were also supposed to pick a research project on their own, which they were then did then pursue independently. So they did actually learn how to conduct empirical research in physics in these uh, courses by Doppler. Doppler was uh, born in, in Salzburg and he studied mathematics and physics um, and also philosophy in Vienna and Salzburg. And then he taught at the Prague uh, Polytechnic Institute. And he, he was already considering emigrating to the US because he, he couldn't find a suitable position thereafter when he was finally offered a teaching post at a secondary school, which he took on. And then he eventually became full professor of mathematics and physics at Prague University, at, um, Charles University in Prague. And this was also his most productive period there. This is where he published um, a lot of scientific papers um, on problems in physics and mathematics, and also his famous work on the Doppler effect. Then uh, soon after he took on a, a position as a professor of uh, mathematics and physics in, in Chemnitz in Slovakia. And uh, only one year later, because of um, circumstances uh, due to the revolution, had to move back to Vienna where he was appointed professor. And there he put this, uh, um, this rather uh, modern um, experimental physics education in place, but he only um, worked at the University of Vienna for two years because his health got so bad. Um, he was so sick already that he died in 1853 at the age of 50 years. Um, his most famous work is of course very well known on the Doppler effect, which is uh, um, describes the influence of the motion with respect to an observer of a sound or, or light source on its wavelength. Um, and this is uh, the Doppler effect is really uh, just like uh, Mendel's uh, Rules of Inheritance, uh, a milestone in, in the history of modern science and has a lot of applications in uh, meteorology. There's the Doppler radar. Of course, there's the radar in air traffic um, and uh, um, street uh, traffic control, but also the medicine uses the, the Doppler sonograph, for example, to determine the velocity of blood flow. So there's uh, numerous applications of um, of the Doppler effect found across the sciences. So what did Mendel actually learn from Doppler? Well, Mendel learned um, experimental investigation, but he also learned how to treat problems mathematically. He got the rigorous mathematical training from the physicists. And uh, one of the big achievements of Mendel, I think, is uh, that he took those methods that he learned from the physicists and he applied them to his own problems in, in botany. Biology wasn't quite as quantitative at the time as, uh, as physics was. So this was quite an achievement of, of Mendel. Biology 
had a quantitative uh, aspect. I'll, in a few minutes, I'll talk about Unger uh, and how he approached problems quantitatively. But of course, it was not as mathematical as the physicists already were back then. And now I want to um, talk a little bit more about uh, Mendel's teacher, Franz Unger, who was a uh, botanist at the University of Vienna. He was uh, born in, in Styria and then he studied law in Graz and um, medicine at the University of Vienna. And then he was first a general practitioner in Stockerau and then subsequently a court physician in Kitzbühel in Tirol. Um, and from there he became professor of botany at the University of Graz and then subsequently at the University of Vienna in 1850. So he, he was a, a new professor at the university when Mendel got there. All of them were, Doppler was also very new. This was a new uh, buzzing sci scientific community there when Mendel arrived. Here is a quote by the famous evolutionary biologist uh, Ernst Mayer from his book, The Growth of Biological Thought, where he writes, among Darwin's many forerunners, few merit mention more than the Viennese botanist Franz Unger. So that's quite a huge compliment for, for Unger. And indeed, um, Unger was an evolutionist who was very far with, with his ideas. Um, Unger had a very broad research program. That he, was a, he did uh, cell biology, also plant anatomy, he studied plant pathology. But he was also interested in the bigger evolutionary picture. He studied plant biogeography, paleobotany, and then he was also an evolutionary theorist on top of this. Unger was already um, somewhat quantitative in his work. So he counted fossil specimens in different geological periods, and he uh, broke those counts down by taxonomic groups and calculated how uh, ratios between those groups shifted over time. So he was able to show quantitatively that the flora of the earliest periods was dominated by algae, and then there were ferns, and then horsetails, and then mosses and conifers, and only finally the flowering plants. He had a quantitative approach to his research, which Mendel probably also got exposed to, although Mendel certainly learned the, the mathematics more from the physicists. And then um, Mendel also did some outreach he actually wrote for the general public. He published a sequence of botanical letters which were published in the newspaper um, uh, the Wiener Zeitung um, and um, in 17 installments and in, in the 16th letter he writes about um, the evolution of the plant world. So this letter was called das Pflanzenreich in seiner zeitlichen Erscheinung or an attempt of a history to the plant world. And in, in this letter, he is very, um, he's uh, describing his evolutionary views and he's very revolutionary in a way. So he um, has an idea um, that he has, he, he expresses this idea that the en entire plant world uh, stems uh, off from a common ancestor. So he writes, there is no doubt that this empirically reconstructed pathway can be theoretically pursued still further back until one finally gets back to an Urpflanze. So he has this idea of uh, the common ancestor, Urpflanze, this is what um, Maya left in the original German here. She describes this idea of a common ancestor. And, and he goes further, actually, here towards the end, he writes how this plant or rather cell ultimately originated is even more hidden from us than the fact of its existence. This much, however, is certain that it must have designated the origin of all organic life and thus the representative of all higher development. So Unger here writes about the constant com common ancestor of all organic life. Uh, and this was a few years before Darwin. So you can imagine that this was somewhat revolutionary. And he also faced some opposition in the general public. There was a Catholic priest who was a little bit offended by, by Unger's writings. His name was uh, Sebastian Brunner. And um, he, wrote, uh, he wrote his own um, response in the Wiener Kirchenzeitung, in the Vienna Church News. Um, he published several ed editorials ridiculing Unger and his work. And um, he, uh, he was um, very um, offended, basically. He, he, he thought that this was in, in stark contrast to, what, to the teachings of the Catholic Church, obviously. So um, he wrote these professors at the so-called Catholic universities. They deliver lectures on really beastly theories for years on end. 
So here we see that this conflict that basically played out later in the UK between Darwin and the Catholic Church all already in a similar version took place on a smaller scale um, in Vienna. Here is another image. This is from uh, Unger's uh, botanical letters where he uh, made a drawing um, of the um, of an extinct uh, giant horsetail forest from Carboniferous. So Unger had very clear ideas of what this extinct plant world actually looked like. And I would like to um, end with this last slide here. This is from uh, Gregor Mendel's famous paper, the famous P paper, Versuche über Pflanzenhybriden, where he uh, writes about his evolutionary inspiration. So he writes, there is an essential difference in those hybrids that remain constant in the progeny and propagate like pure strains. And this feature is of particular importance to the evolutionary history of plants because constant hybrids attain the status of new species. So here in his introduction to his paper, Mendel writes about the status of new species. He, he, he formulates the species problem, where the new species come from. He doesn't treat this problem in what comes later, but he was aware of this uh, this problem. So he he was an evolutionary thinker himself. He was inspired from his uh, um, teachers who were evolutionary thinkers. And uh, despite the fact that Mendel's paper is often interpreted as a uh, as a plant breeder's paper, um, clearly Mendel had uh, um, an evolutionary inspiration. And uh, with this, I would like to end. And here is a little bit of. Uh, literature here some references for uh, if some somebody's interested thank you very much for listening and watching this video was supported by the project number 80 cz 278 with the title gregor johann mendel's legacy to science culture and humanity which is co-financed by the interreg austria and czech republic down below you see the title of the project in german and czech the main goal of the project is actually to promote Mendel's legacy by long-term cross-border collaboration in science and culture. There is a strategic plan developed that will promote this legacy in the fields of science and culture in Czech Republic, Austria, but also worldwide. This promotion will take various forms, be it meetings, workshops, publications, audio and video materials. One of the main parts of the project is actually rebuilding Mendel's original greenhouse in the Augustinian Abbey in Brno. This newly rebuilt greenhouse will be a new landmark, not just the city of Brno or the country of Czech Republic, but the entirety of the scientific fields of genetics as such. Mendel's greenhouse is the very place where genetics was born where with the first genetics experiment conducted on peace. Therefore, it is a really, really important location for the field of genetics. As a major outcome of this Interreg project, this greenhouse will become available for the general public, but also the scientific community as a multi-purpose gathering place for cultural and scientific events. This and much more you can find out if you visit the website gjm200.cz, which of course stands for Gregor Johann Mendel and the 200 indicating the 200th birthday of Gregor Mendel, which we celebrate in 2022. Once again, a great thank you to the project and Interact for the support of this video. Thank you for your time you spent on it watching. And from my side, I just wish you a very nice day.